This program is brought to you by Emory University. Yeah. Uh, well, good afternoon. I'm Robert Shapiro, Dean of Emory Law School, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to this wonderful panel uh, with the provocative title, LGBT Equality and Religious Liberty, Friends or Foes. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Outlaw and the Center for the Study of Law and Religion for hosting this important conversation on such a vital issue. I'd like to thank our participants, especially Professor Douglas Farrow from McGill. He came all the way from Montreal to participate. Welcome. I'd also like to thank very much my colleagues from Emory who didn't come from as far, but we value their contributions very much. Uh, that would be Professors John Witte and Michael Perry. Uh, and our students, Matt Cavadon and Tim Wilson. Now, well, while the debate over marriage rights for gay and lesbian couples has dominated the headlines, a broader conversation about LGBT inclusion and religious freedom is taking place in pews, homes, and offices throughout this country and in other Western democracies as well. Some churches, synagogues, and mosques wonder whether they will be forced to accommodate same-sex wedding ceremonies and celebrations, while others already welcome gay and lesbian unions. Religious schools, hospitals, and charities face an uncertain legal terrain if they refuse to provide employment to LGBT individuals, insurance and other benefits to same-sex spouses, and certain services such as adoption placement to lesbian and gay couples. Individuals who own businesses or work for the government may worry whether non-discrimination laws could force them to trade their religious convictions for the right to do business or maintain their employment. At what point must religious objections to LGBT relationships give way to the civil rights of LGBT citizens? At what point must the demands of the LGBT community for full equality make peace with religious citizens' freedom of conscience and practice? This panel will seek to answer these questions and to draw a line where one can be drawn, and perhaps most importantly, to determine to what extent the fundamental values of religious freedom and equal protection of the law are truly in conflict. Well, I know we will all benefit from the discussion, so please join me in thanking and welcoming our panelists. Well, it's wonderful to be here. My name is John Witte. I uh, serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. I have the privilege of teaching a number of you in the audience, and I have the privilege of uh, moderating this panel. I'm sitting in the cleft right between the two tables to indicate that I am an entirely neutral arbiter of this conversation. Uh, I do not have a stake uh, in this uh, conversation today, even though, like you, uh, we all have a stake uh, in the difficult issues that are now before us as a polity, as citizens, as communicants, as members of a number of different communities as we wrestle through uh, the new issues, the new challenges, the new opportunities uh, that the rise of LGBT identity and practice uh, gives to our polity and gives to us personally. I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, Timothy Wilson, the president of Outlaw, uh, and uh, his colleagues uh, on the Outlaw group uh, for spearheading this conversation uh, and for getting us into deep conversation about these issues. Uh, issues of religious liberty and issues of uh, gay and lesbian identity often get uh, reduced to simple sound bites on television, get reduced to strong tirades on both sides, get reduced to uh, two warring factions uh, that see the other as the enemy. And Mr. Wilson and his colleagues uh, have seen the necessity uh, and indeed the absolute demand on us uh, as learned citizens, as budding lawyers, as budding uh, leaders of the bench and the bar and society uh, to be in deeper conversation, to contextualize issues, to see what's at stake, uh, and to give us all uh, a greater traction in the negotiation of an issue that's going to be before us over the next uh, 50 years, at least in the United States and beyond in the West. 
I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, be in conversation with uh, four distinguished colleagues. Um, Douglas Farrow, uh, distinguished professor of religious studies who is here from McGill University in Montreal. Uh, a great apostle from the North who has been deeply involved in the conversation uh, about same-sex marriage, about same-sex rights, about the role of religious liberty, and the role particularly of religious organizations in their deliberations about same-sex practice, identity, ordination, and more. Um, he is the author or editor of uh, a score of books, uh, several scores of articles. Uh, a few of his provocative titles include A Nation of Bastards uh, and Divorcing Marriage. And he's also editor of a wonderful series on great theologians. It's wonderful for you to spend some time with us, my friend, and to have you uh, in our company. On the other side is my equally distinguished colleague, Professor Michael J. Perry, who is our Robert W. Wooder Professor of Law, the highest accolade that we give to an academic at this institution, and who is a world leader in the conversation of law, religion, and morality. He has been writing in, with alacrity on hard questions uh, that raise um, issues of uh, legal and religious and cultural and ethical import and capital punishment, uh, issues of abortion and issues of same-sex marriage have been amongst the things that have occupied him uh, in the 15 titles and 75 uh, articles uh, that he has published. Timothy Wilson, our colleague who is the president of Outlaw, comes from Georgetown University as an undergrad and is now a second year JD student here at Emory. Uh, he is the executive articles editor of the Emory Law Journal. Oh, this, the executive symposium editor, forgive me, of the Emory Law Journal. I, I hope I didn't give you a crown uh, that you didn't deserve. Um, <laughs> but he's a great guy. Um, and Matthew Cavadon, who is a second year student. He's doing the JDMTS with us in the Law and Theology program. Uh, he comes to us from Harvard College and now is in his second year of doing uh, the dual degree work. Uh, and he's the executive articles, articles editor of the Emory International uh, Law Review. Um, this is designed to be a deep and thoughtful conversation about fundamentals. Uh, and it's designed to give each uh, of our distinguished colleagues the opportunity to speak to a number of different issues. Uh, our thought was to spend um, 50, 55 minutes together in conversation around some pre-circulated topics that we've shared by email uh, and that I'll share with you as we move through them. I have three different topics I want to get to uh, and then we're going to open the floor to conversation with each of you. Um, if we could ask your indulgence in the course of these first 45, 50 minutes uh, to hold your questions and comments until such time as we open the floor, that would make for a, uh, a politer and probably a more uh, streamlined conversation. Uh, but please do collect your questions and comments along the way when we get to the Q&A uh, so that we can keep this as a conversation amongst us, even though four of us are dominating it at the beginning. The first uh, collection of topics that I want to spend a bit of time on are to set a bit of the philosophical and sociological and cultural framework for our questions. Not to jump right into legal issues, but to have a chance to uh, contextualize um, the dialectics as, as it's emerging. And I guess the first question we want to ask is whether we have pitched the conflict right. Is there a religious freedom claim? Is there an LGBT claim uh, of equality or rights? Are they in tension? Some would say religious liberty is nothing more than simply what religious people and non-religious people collectively enjoy. Free speech, free rights, free association, and not, nothing more, nothing less. Others would say that LGBT identity and practice and equality uh, is simply an atavistic ideal but can't be yet cast in constitutional terms. And the notion of equality loads the dice and makes it harder for us to have a serious conversation about this. And there are many that are trying to find a way in between. And to situate that way in between, I'd like to just lift up a passage from one of the amicus briefs written by the American Jewish Committee uh, supporting um, the Perry case. Uh, and I've isolated a passage that I've recirculated to my colleagues, but I'd like to read it to you just to help frame things a bit and then open the floor to a conversation amongst the four of us about it. Here is a, a, a brief uh, piece of their argument that tries to say what's really at stake in their view, a middle way between these hard positions I've just tried to describe. Quote, there is a sad irony to the bitter conflict between supporters of same-sex rights and religious parties. 
Both same-sex couples and committed religious believers argue that some aspects of human identity are so fundamental that they should be left to each individual, free of all non-essential regulation, even when manifest in public. No same-sex party can change his sexual orientation by any act of will, and no religious believer can change his understanding of divine command by an act of will. Both same-sex couples and religious dissenters face the problem that what they experience as among the highest virtues is condemned by others as grave evil. Where same-sex couples see loving commitments of mutual care and support, many religious believers see disordered conduct that violates natural law and scriptural command. And where those religious believers see obedience to a loving God who undoubtedly knows best when he lays down rules for human conduct, Many supporters of gay rights see intolerance, bigotry, and hate. So to open the conversation, let me just ask our respective panelists, is this a fair characterization of what's at stake? Are the respective claims of LGBT parties and religious liberty parties ontologically comparable? Is this a clash truly of fundamental rights on both sides, and are they each equally fundamental and legal? in philosophical terms. And so let's start with our colleague from the North, uh, Professor Douglas Farrow, and ask him to speak uh, to this issue. I'm asking each of our panelists to talk for three or four minutes um, max, uh, but then move to a freer flowing discussion as we move forward. Professor Farrow. Thank you very much, and let me say uh, that it is indeed an honor to be here. As I said to, uh, to Tim uh, before I came down, I feel a bit like a theological sheep in the midst of lawyerly wolves, but, uh, but I don't feel especially uh, conflictual and, and, and confrontational or anything. Um, and in that sense, what we heard from the amicus brief is, is um, while it's un undoubtedly a reality that we can observe on our TV screens and, and that some of us have experienced at one point or another, is, is, is perhaps uh, uh, unnecessarily conflictual in its presentation of the matter, and, and, uh, and, and I think we'll probably, in spite of having disagreements here, be able to, to uh, um, approach them, as you say, in a, in a more uh, reasoned light. I don't know if these remarks will help, but it seems to me that, that uh, religious liberty derives uh, from the nature of the person as such. Uh, that it's universal and fundamental uh, in that sense, whether it is being claimed by an individual or because of the nature of religion, which tends to be uh, a corporate exercise uh, claimed collectively, perhaps even by uh, a, a legal person uh, rather than a, a natural person. Um, so it's a fundamental freedom. Uh, the right to equality before the law also derives from the dignity of the person, um, but, it, it, but it, it doesn't seem to me that it's, it's fundamental in quite the same sense, uh, because it is it, or amounts to a negation of a negation. Law serves as a restraint uh, for the sake of freedom, I would say. I mean, I believe that law has a very positive purpose, but it does serve as a restraint, and this is a kind of restraint on a restraint uh, that, we, that we want to claim that every person is entitled to more, no uh, more or less benefit of the law's restraint than, than anyone else. So I think we should distinguish between religious liberty as a fundamental freedom and the right to equality before the law uh, as a derivative, highly important and, and universal right, uh, but as derivative. As far as the, the rights of, of LGBT persons, I would be inclined myself towards the view um, that, that first and foremost, this is the right of any person as such. Um, if it's something more than that, uh, if something more than that is being claimed under the rubric of group rights, say, uh, this may be problematic in a number of ways that we'll need to explore. Uh, first of all, LGBT is not a single group. Um, nor does it offer a single claim or justification for its identity. Um, so those are things that we would want to explore, I think, uh, as we further that. But at least for my first intervention, I, I, I'm going to limit myself to the three minutes you gave me. Thank you so much. Professor Perry. I, I think it's uh, 
important to begin the discussion with two very fundamental distinctions. Um, one distinction is, the first distinction is between two distinct sets of issues. The first set of issues is whether it is consistent with our constitutional commitments for a state to deny access to civil marriage to same-sex couples. A very distinct issue is whether if a state does grant access to, same, to civil marriage to same-sex couples, what conscience protections it should establish uh, for those who object on moral grounds to same-sex sexual uh, relationships, what conscience protection should be established. Those are very distinct issues. The other, the other fundamental distinction that I think um, it's important to make in, um, in, in articulating a position on these issues is the distinction between any law or policy that presupposes a demeaning, dehumanizing understanding of a person or group of persons as distinct from a law or policy that does not do that, but rather represents a moral objection or tries to protect a moral objection to particular conduct. And, and um, so I, I may have occasion in the course of our discussion this afternoon to refer to these, these distinctions, especially the latter distinction between acts that presuppose a demeaning or dehumanizing view of a person or group of persons as distinct from acts that simply represent a moral objection that do not, not do that, but represent a moral objection to particular conduct. Now, let me, let me go back to this uh, question of the role of the, uh, what is actually a human right to religious freedom. Um, I think there's a, it's very interesting because clearly the human right to religious freedom would support, I think, properly understood, various conscience protections for those who conscientiously, conscientiously object to cooperating with same-sex marriage, if a state does grant access to civil marriage to couples. But in my judgment, a judgment I defend at length in a book that will be published later this year, the principal reason why states, in my judgment, should be understood as obligated to grant access to civil marriage to same-sex couples is not an equality argument. It's not the right to moral equality. It is instead the right to religious freedom. So interestingly, on this, in this controversy, you have the right to religious freedom doing important work, if I'm right, on both sides, so to speak, of the issue. And maybe we'll have a chance to flesh that out eventually. Mr. Cavadon. Professor Perry started by drawing two fundamental distinctions. I would like to draw three. I can see law functioning in three ways. One is that it reaches certain activity to prohibit it or suppress it. Two, it elevates certain activity and grants it support and endorsement. And three, between different people, it mediates different claims and protects people from each other. So two of these claims have to do with the relationship between the government and the people. One of them has to do with the relationship between people. On the first level, the issue of freedom from state interference, I think it's fair to say that religious liberty and expressions of sexual identity are both free in this country and in most of the Western tradition. Under our current law, through Lawrence v. Texas, under the First Amendment, the courts have repeatedly said that the government exists insofar as it infringes on activity to protect public health, safety, and morals. That last one, public morals, only extends so far. It does not reach into people's private lives. It mainly acts on the areas of obscenity. On the second level, as far as government support of certain activity, the Western liberal tradition in general is much more flexible. Outside of this country, religious groups, even in countries that strongly protect religious freedom, have the ability to compete for different levels of state support and recognition. In most European countries, there are still established churches, or were until quite recently. That was seen to be compatible with religious liberty, 
You can be free from state interference in your religious beliefs, but still have the government say, this particular religious tradition embodies something of our national values and something of our shared public morals. It's entitled to a certain niche. In the United States, that isn't an option when it comes to religion. The First Amendment Establishment Clause forecloses that. On issues of sexuality, family, and other things, though, I think the United States is still in a position, like a lot of the rest of the Western world, where different visions can compete for state support. The European Court of Human Rights has said that European countries can distinguish between certain kinds of intimate relationships and choose to favor some over others as long as it does not infringe on particular expressions. I think that's where we find ourselves today with regards to family law. Lastly, there's that question of how much people can make claims to legal protection from other people when they exercise and express their religious and their sexual identities. We're going to be spending the next 45 to 50 minutes on that, so I'll leave the particulars to those questions. Mr. Wilson. I would like to go off what Professor Farrow mentioned in that discussing that the right to religious freedom is a fundamental human right. I would personally argue, and I believe that Professor Perry may agree with me on this, is that the right to express your sexual identity is also a fundamental human right. Um, Professor Farrow mentioned that uh, it, it, when we see things in terms of individual rights, that's one issue, but if we look at it further and look at the LGBT community uh, as a group, an issue of perhaps he would term it special group rights, that would be more problematic. Um, I would argue that when you juxtapose religious freedom and uh, LGBT identity, there are, there's really less of a conflict and perhaps even more of a complementarity. Um, I think that with issues of religious freedom, such as expression, um, our Constitution and the First Amendment, the Free Exercise Clause, does protect our right to express our religion uh, through uh, ritual, through practice, through uh, in, uh, membership in church organizations. And I would, I would likewise submit that perhaps we have a fundamental right to express as Matt mentioned, through our free speech rights in the First Amendment, through our due process rights in the 14th Amendment, a right to express our sexual identities in a way that allows for full inclusion in our social community and as American citizens. Um, and I would say that part of that is necessarily the civil marriage question. Being granted inclusion into the civil marriage contract is just part and parcel of citizenship. and. Therefore, I would say that, of course, necessarily uh, equal protection issues come to the fore. Now, when the civil side of this is um, asserted, there, of course, are then questions of conscientious objection and conscious protections that different states or the federal government may put in place. Uh, the free exercise clause of the First Amendment may require that. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, has been very hostile to judicial exceptions for such cases, so it would be left to most likely state legislatures to craft those, and that's something that we'll be discussing in a little more detail throughout this conversation. But I would like the audience to keep in mind that perhaps these two values aren't completely in conflict, and perhaps LGBT identity and the right to express that identity is mutually reinforcing with the right of religious freedom and expression. Listening to this, these four panelists, I, I hear everybody confirm that religious freedom is a fundamental right, and I'm hearing sharp differences as to what forms of LGBT identity are protected by rights, let alone fundamental rights. If I heard correctly, um, I hear Professor, Mr. Wilson uh, give the strongest endorsement to the idea that LGBT identity uh, and practice and expression and association, including through marriage, is a fundamental right anchored as he sees it in the 14th Amendment, uh, due process clause, anchored in part, and I take it in the equal protection clause, anchored, anchored in part in the free speech and free assembly clauses of the First Amendment uh, and their application through the 14th Amendment to the states and the local governments. Uh, if I hear Professor Farrell right, um, I'm hearing him say religious liberty is a fundamental right, uh, but uh, LGBT identity um, is um, a right whose day is still coming uh, because it's derivative 
or is it protected in part by a derivative second class right called equal protection? I'd like to hear that out a little bit. If I hear Mr. Cavadon, uh, Mr. Cavadon doesn't deny the freedom of LGBT identity and ex private expression, consensual expression. The issue is, is to what extent does the government have to facilitate, support, allow, and indeed welcome that in institutions like marriage and other institutions that are available? And if I hear my friend Professor Perry right, uh, Mr. Perry is, Professor Perry um, stipulates very strongly uh, that LGBT identity expression association uh, and marriage are fundamental rights anchored not only in the Constitution but international human rights frameworks. Um, have I characterized your respective positions correctly and could you embroider them further to the extent I have? Well, John, let me just say I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't say that there's a fundamental human right to say same-sex marriage, what I said was that in my judgment, the best argument that states must grant access to civil marriage to same-sex couples is an argument based on the fundamental human right to religious freedom. So in other words, that, uh, that I, you can look through the documents of, the, of international law and you're not going to see any fundamental human right uh, that mentions sex. The, you will find a doc, in, in many of the documents a fundamental human right mentioning religious freedom. My argument is that the best argument for insisting that states grant access to civil marriage to same-sex couples is based on that right. How so? I don't see oh, it. I, 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 I don't think you want me to go there. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we have, we have time. Uh, that, that would involve an elaboration of the right, the Article 18 right, for example, to religious freedom, its particular requirements, the legitimacy, least restrictive alternative proportionality, and then subjecting the arguments in support of excluding same-sex couples from civil marriage to those tests. So I think for present purposes, and I, and I, I do that at length in, in my new book, the, um, I think for present purposes, I just wanted to emphasize a kind of irony that many of those who are concerned about the possibility that states may grant access to civil marriage to same-sex couples because that may create problems for religious liberty seem not to understand that the very refusal to grant access to civil marriage to same-sex couples is, if I'm right, fundamentally problematic in terms of the very same right to religious freedom. So the right to religious freedom and includes within it the right to marriage, and the right to marriage includes within it um, LGBT uh, couples. The right to religious freedom entails the conclusion that states may not deny access to civil marriage to same-sex couples if the arguments in support of denying access to civil marriage to same-sex couples do not pass muster under the various questions required by an application of the right to religious freedom. So is it part of it is a prophylactic argument that to deny LGBT parties the right to marry is in many ways to imperil religious freedom? Because the same logic would apply to the claim of religious freedom that would apply to the LGBT claimant? Under the right to religious freedom, just to give you the, the, a very sharp precis of the argument, under the right to religious freedom, I think it's, it's clear that um, both religious, religiously, if, if the fundamental interest that the state is trying to protect in not granting same-sex couples access to civil marriage is the interest in not giving the state's imprimatur to conduct deemed immoral. And if the conduct is, if the reasons for deeming the conduct immoral are either religious in the conventional sense, say biblically based, the kind of arguments we're familiar with here in Georgia, or they are sectarian moral arguments of the sort the church, yep. John Courtney Murray said the churches were, that, that then the conclusion is that's not a legitimate interest under the right to religious freedom. I hear you. But, but, but again, that's a, it's... Complicated argument, new book coming out. Uh, and, and I'll be talking about... <laughs> Have I gotten your positions right? Um, I, I, perhaps not exactly, but then you haven't had lunch, uh, so um, <laughs> you're, you're doing very well in spite of Have that. Have slow of wit. Well. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think I want to emphasize that, um, that religious liberty, I do not first of all think of in terms of 
in, in think of in terms of a right, uh, but I think of it as a freedom, as, and I, I, I think it's important to make that distinction. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is something that um, is understood uh, to allow the person to transcend their, their, their uh, limitations by acknowledging the, the limiter, so to say. And, um, and it, it is a responsibility, a duty of the state and of the law to recognize that liberty. And so then we can talk about a right to religious freedom. Um, but I think it's important to have the order uh, right there. Um, as far as the, the um, right to equality before the law, um, uh, I suggested that this is also universal, or ought to be, um, and, uh, but because it was, uh, as I put it, a, a negation of a negation, it isn't as fundamental uh, as religious liberty per se. Uh, as far as the uh, right of LGBT persons, um, uh, I'm putting that in the scare quotes, uh, um, uh, my concern there is that I'm not sure what an LGBT person is, and I'm not sure that the case has been made for, for, uh, for treating this class of person um, in a coherent fashion. In fact, I will... Uh, probably have to elaborate at some point, um, how I think the internal philosophy of personhood at work in, in this movement, uh, which is a collection of diverse movements, uh, and, and as in doesn't, it does not hold together in some coherent fashion that is yet ready to present itself publicly. If it could do that, then we could talk about that. So uh, are you saying that uh, LGBT and scare quotes parties are deserving of freedom rights, but not Affirmative rights? Well, any person is uh, deserving of the rights of which we have been speaking. That is, the recognition of their innate religious liberty and uh, a recognition of their equality before the law. Well, let me just say if that... An, let me just finish. If, an LG, if a lesbian couple comes before the state and says, I want the right to marry, say... Uh, are you saying that that is not a right claim because their identity itself hasn't been already constructed by the law? Um, not in that, in that context, I wouldn't say that, no. I would say they have always had the right to marry. Michael, do you want to speak to this? I, I, just, I just wanted to say, although I, I hesitate to say it because it, it may be uh, more technical than is appropriate for this venue, but the idea that the right, uh, the equality right, is a derivative right seems to me fundamentally wrong. The right, what I call the right to moral equality, shorthand for the right to be treated as a moral equal, the right not to be treated as morally inferior to someone else, um, there's nothing derivative about it. It, it is uh, uh, as fully a deduction from the fundamental normative ground of human rights, the uh, act towards all human beings in a spirit of brotherhood, as the right to religious freedom. Um, everyone deserves the right to be treated, not, not to be treated by its government in a dehumanizing, demeaning way, now, it'd be very understandable if you thought this was the prelude to an argument that denying same-sex uh, access to civil marriage to same-sex couples necessarily does that. I've not said that. In fact, my argument about denying access to civil marriage to same-sex couples does not invoke the right to moral equality. It invokes the right to religious freedom. Mr. Farrell. Well, uh, there are a number of problems there from my perspective. Um, one is that... Um, uh, I'll look forward to your new book, but uh, from the previous one, I, I'm not convinced of the case you're trying to make for uh, uh, moral freedom or of the concept itself. I, I think the work uh, that, that that does uh, is really the same work as freedom of conscience ought to do. And, and I, I'm, you know, it'd be fun actually to go into to this philosophical issue a little further if, if time Please permits. Don't. But, <laughs> but the, um, but the second, the second uh, thing is that you, you, you keep uh, referring to um, the right of couples to marry. And, and that is not based in, in, in any uh, international or national jurisprudence that I'm aware of. I didn't say the right of couples to marry. Yes, I, you did. I said the right 
the, the right to religious freedom entails the obligation of states to admit same-sex couples to civil marriage. Professor Perry. <laughs> that's, that's a different statement. Let me, let me it is. You made both I'll of them. I'll give you a word, but I'm going to get Cavett on and Wilson on this, too. Please finish your point. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I've been, staying, I've been staying away from same-sex marriage in this conversation so far because um, you know, having written a book called Nation of Bastards, I, I, I worry about discussing the subject any further. I did, by the way, take the title of that book from a footnote in Rousseau, and it deals with this kind of issue uh, about the, the, the uh, uh, it deals with the competition, in fact, uh, between the state and the church over, uh, over the fabric of, of social life and civil society, and it's in that context that I discussed it. It has nothing to do with people being born out of wedlock, although uh, that was the origin of the phrase for him. Um, so uh, I think myself that, um, that the, the concept of same-sex marriage is fundamentally flawed, and that if it is embraced by a society and uh, by a state in whichever order that happens. In my country it happened that the state embraced it first uh, after asking the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada whether it could do so um, and, and, and society followed. Um, but whatever order that happens in, I think, it's a, I think it involves some, uh, you know, a fundamental mistake which is almost certain to pit equality rights and uh, against religious freedom, and to do so in a way that is virtually irresolvable. So how's that for uh, a challenge? Thank you. I'm gonna give Mr. Wilson and Mr. Cavett on each an opportunity to speak finally to this question, and I'm gonna push us on into our next unit if we could. Uh, Mr. Wilson, please. I would like to respond to the issue of LGBT identity. Professor Farrow says that in his opinion, uh, LGBT identity is not something that is defined enough or uh, unitive enough to be part of a, of a social or political uh, decision-making process, such as extending civil marriage rights to those couples. Um, my, my view on this is that for those of us who are LGBT, uh, I think in a lot of these debates and discussions, there is not enough charity given to our own understanding of what it means to be LGBT. I think that when, when we do have um, debates, and I'm not speaking of this one, but I mean in generally out there and uh, that's happening right now in this country and in other countries, I do not think our opponents often give us the intellectual charity of accepting who we believe and know that we are. Um, I don't think that uh, there is, when, when people uh, say that, oh, well, the jury's out on the issue of the social science on sexual identity. I would respond that in, in a public policy discussion, who should, who should be saying that? Someone who has no personal context with it or people that are actually, um, you know, in the nitty-gritty of it. And when we apply this, this view to same-sex marriage and for securing marriage rights for LGBT individuals, we, we, I mean, we do have to think in terms of our identity because the Supreme Court speaks in a lot of its marriage jurisprudence about marriage being a part of forming a family, forging an identity, being a, uh, a lifelong partnership that is facilitated within the privacy of a family that is not defined by the state, but is defined by the moral interests of the individuals. We see that in Loving, we see that in, I believe, the Blocky versus Red Hail, which some of you remember reading in class. And if, if those sort of individualist assumptions are true in our jurisprudence here in America, then I think that in, in these kinds of legal debates, we need to be more aware of whose interests are we talking about. And here it's LGBT individuals. And we choose to identify with each other, and I think that choice at a threshold level should be honored. Good. Mr. Cavadon, last uh, intervention on this point, and then we're going to move to some concrete issues. Public policy when it comes to government support is a question of drawing lines. I think it's probably true that the LGBT community has a strong sense of identity and distinction on one side in terms of we are not straight people, we have these certain claims. I'd be curious to see where the line comes down on the other side, though, of limiting factors. 
psychologists often talk now about sexuality as a spectrum. If we're going to make it all about the individual, how does that translate in terms of family law and government support? Family law is not a question of individuals. It's a question of certain units being in and certain ones being out. I think it's possible, indeed I think it's likely, that in the next 40 years we're going to be having discussions about polyamory, about more open-ended intimate relationships, et cetera, within the context of law. I want to know what the limiting factors are. Where can the government stop saying, no, we're not going to recognize every possible shifting association between individuals as the same as everyone else's, even if the government can't intrude and ban any of those things? To turn briefly to Professor Perry, I'm just having a difficult time seeing what constitutes a religious argument or a sectarian argument. Early arguments for abolition often emerged out of a religious context. For that matter, arguments for religious liberty and for disestablishment came out of a certain liberal Protestant sectarian context. I don't see how that's a useful way for parsing through what's permissible and what's not. I think it's more of a question of, in a democracy, people can bring the things that they have to bear, religion, sexual identity, personal experiences. Democracy has ways of allowing each of those things to have a seat at the table. So don't, could I have I? to have, I'm sorry, uh, bri very briefly, yes. 30 seconds? Yes, yes, just, just to clarify for Tim, um, uh, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a challenge to how uh, individuals perceive themselves or how they choose to associate. It was a challenge in respect to, I mean, even the, the shorthand LGBT, uh, as we know, is, is, is highly extendable. Uh, the TTIQ, Q2SA, et cetera. And I think, I think the Q is especially important because there is and always has been uh, a, a division within that larger uh, a collation of communities between those, for example, who think that sexuality is, is biologically determined and those who believe that it is a social construct and, and, and ultimately a personal construct, something that one chooses and develops and changes as they see fit. Um, that's, a, that's a fundamental question for anthropology for all of us. It is not settled inside the community that is loosely and by shorthand referred to as LGBT. And until it is, some of the arguments, even the arguments for same-sex marriage, do not go here. Mr. Wilson, a 30-second response, so we're going to move on. I would say that even if uh, you know, those people within the community who do not believe that sexuality is biologically predetermined and who may believe that um, the, there is a spectrum of sexuality and it is something that one either discovers or grows into, um, that's just part of their individual right to define who they are, like you said, you did grant that, um, and who they will love. Uh, I, I do agree that in, in framing public policy responses to um, such a broad fluidity of sexual identity is certainly a new challenge for us, but I don't think it's one that is insurmountable. Matt brings up different issues on where do we draw the line um, but I, I do think that we, we're having a lot more social scientific evidence on, on pa new parenting structures, on new couple relationships, and I, I think that there are lines that can be drawn, and I think that a society continues to consider these things in more detail and actually consider the LGBT community where just 20, 30 years ago we weren't even considered in terms of public policy debates. Um, I, I think that society can respond in an intelligent way to these developments. Excellent. We've had a good uh, philosophical range of positions laid out, uh, eloquently stated by my colleagues, and I appreciate uh, their candor with each other. Uh, my apologies to, for barking at Professor Perry, uh, <laughs> but my Calvinist sense of order was violated by I, his I uh, need it. spontaneous I need it. intervention. Um, we're going to be talking about religious liberty and same-sex marriage uh, for the next uh, uh, number of years as we think through the Perry case and other cases that are coming down. But I want to locate uh, some other fora in which clashes between religious liberty claims and LGBT claims um, are beginning to manifest themselves and seek the wisdom of this panel as we think through a few of those uh, areas of growing uh, tension uh, and help us sort out exactly what the dean was inviting for us to think about 
the line drawing that's inevitable that lawyers do very well, artificial and blurry as those lines sometimes have to be. And so I've got a few venues which I've related to my colleagues already in a uh, pre-circular uh, that I want to work through a bit before we're going to turn the floor uh, over to you for some questions. So let's first start in private schools. Um, I've got two kinds of questions about private schools. One, a relatively easy one. We in the, this country, as you know, divide between public schools that are state-run and private schools, some of which are private religious schools that are chartered by religious communities and uh, incorporated uh, at state law and accredited by the state but are free to run with their own religious identities and practices pervasive uh, in everything they do. And so a private religious school decides to have its annual prom. It's a religious school that follows traditional Christian morality. The prom has been a wonderful occasion to get together every year with the high school uh, senior class. Jack and George want to come uh, as dates. The private religious school principal says, so sorry, the prom is only for Jack and Jill, not for Jack and George. It's only for straight couples, not gay couples. Jack and George bring an action in court seeking relief. That's one question. A little harder question. Private religious schools um, are required to maintain curricula and to teach certain prescribed courses and sometimes use prescribed textbooks. Let's say that the state of Massachusetts, the first state that recognized same-sex marriage, decides um, we want to make sure that every student in private and public schools alike uh, receives instruction in social science about marriage and family life, uh, and the prescribed textbook that we have has a long chapter on the identity of both straight and gay life uh, and the importance of letting straight and gay couples um, date, um, relate to each other, associate together, and get married. And it's important that both of their choices be respected. The private religious school principal objects and says, you're violating my religious freedom and my understanding of what marriage is that I'm trying to teach to my students. Both these cases coming out of private school uh, come to you, uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, how would you resolve them? Let's start with my colleague, Professor Ferry. Perry. Well, let me, um, John mentioned a brief submitted by the American Jewish Congress, authored by Doug Laycock, Mark Stern, and Tom Berg. Those three gentlemen and myself have been sending a letter to state legislatures that begins as follows. This was to the state legislature of Illinois. Senate Bill 0010 providing for same-sex marriage is now before the House. We urge you to amend the bill to include robust and specific protections for religious liberty and then that you pass the bill. Any bill on same-sex marriage should include religious liberty protections on the lines proposed in separate letters you have received. We support same-sex marriage. We think the pending bills can be a great advance for human liberty, but careless or overly aggressive drafting could create a whole new set of problems for the religious liberty of those religious believers who cannot conscientiously participate in implementing the new regime. So I, I brought the letter with me because I want you to know that there are many of us, like the drafters of that amicus brief, Doug Laycock being one of the two greatest religious liberty scholar litigators of his generation, who are very supportive of the move towards same-sex marriage, but very concerned that conscience protections be uh, established in the laws. And with respect to the particular issues that John raises, it seems to me the answers are easy. You're talking about a private school, especially a religiously affiliated private school. The conscience protection should say that they are not required to accommodate either the prom uh, situation or the textbook situation. We can go into that, but it seems to me that's a fairly easy case. Anybody differ on that? The Supreme Court of Canada differs. Um, uh, I, I suspect they differ. Certainly the provincial courts differ. Uh, there was, of course, the famous uh, Mark Hall case in, in Ontario uh, was dubbed the prom case, and uh, the, the court decided that the school, uh, a Catholic school in this case, uh, had to uh, accept uh, him and his partner at the prom. Uh, 
Um, I've been involved in, as an expert witness in uh, a case in, in uh, Quebec, which doesn't deal with the same sex question, but deals with the question of textbooks and, and religious liberty. Uh, and uh, the lower court uh, gave a resounding judgment along the lines that you think are obvious, and I, I share your view. Um, even called the state action, which was imposing on uh, this Catholic school again, Loyola uh, School in Montreal, uh, the obligation of taking a good part of its teaching day to teach in religion and ethics and to do so specifically from a non-Catholic standpoint. So imposing on a Catholic school the, the, the demand that it teach in a non-Catholic fashion. Um, the lower court called that totalitarian in nature. Um, the Court of Appeal said, no, it's just a minor infringement on religious freedom. And it will, it's been, a uh, petition has been made to the Supreme Court. We don't know uh, yet whether it will be heard there, and if so, what the judgment will be. Um, but uh, I wish that the case were as obvious as, as you and I think it is. It's obvious, it's just the Canadian Supreme Court doesn't see it. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I wish that religious liberty were as obvious as you and I agree it is, but we all know that there are you know, serious uh, uh, legal scholars in America who, who are beginning to deny that it is a fundamental liberty or right at all. Fortunately, I think American jurisprudence may be as clear than Canada's. Some of our earliest due process cases against states involved religious schools. Pierce v. Society of Sisters in Oregon all the way back in the 1920s held, and that was the day and age back before incorporation of the Bill of Rights was normal, that schools had a right to operate, that parents had a right to educate children in accordance with their beliefs, that schools had the ability to set a religious curriculum if they chose to do so. That was an opinion that was reiterated a few years later in Mayor v. Nebraska it was a case where nativism drove Nebraska to ban foreign language schools. Justice Sutherland, mean old racist anti-Semite that he was, insisted, insisted that the state could not do this because parents have that fundamental right. And fast forwarding a few more years to the 1960s, Wisconsin v. Yoder, Amish parents tried to withdraw their students from the school said, if you keep them in school, you will disrupt our ability to transmit our beliefs and our way of life to these students. The court said, of course, education is a huge interest of the state, but not so huge that it overrides the parents' interest in transmitting beliefs. So I, I agree that both of these cases are fairly easy, and I think under American jurisprudence, most courts would strongly agree with that, including the Supreme Court. Mr. Wilson is going to take a bye. I'm going to give him the first right to speak to the next typo I'd like to have. A uh, Catholic couple, very ardent, uh, very serious, uh, run a mom and pop store, little corner store. They sell bread and milk and newspapers and other sundries. Uh, they're private. They serve a local community, not a big outfit at all, but they're very proud about their Christian identity and have it indeed on the sign of the door. We are a Christian sundry store. Um, one of their employees um, declares to them, he's gay. They dismiss him. Or, more wrinkle, um, one of their employees uh, declares that he's gay and he's entering into a marriage uh, with his partner. They dismiss him. He brings an action. The Catholic couple claims conscience. How do you resolve this dispute, Mr. Wilson? Well, I would first say that on the first issue, if an employee comes out to their employer, no matter how small the employer is, if that state has a non-discrimination uh, law and employment that includes sexual orientation, I would argue that as a public business that has a public business license from the state, the business is holding itself out to the public for the provision of goods, such as food. And I think that in such a case and under current Supreme Court jurisprudence that allows for generally applicable facially neutral laws uh, that do not, as long as they do not specifically discriminate against religious practice or expression, um, I think that, that such a firing should be actionable under law. I do not think that 
uh, there should necessarily be conscious uh, exceptions and conscious provisions for um, employers who choose to employ people. Um, and in this case, if, if this person actually enters into a civil marriage in the state and uh, same-sex marriage is legal, then the state even has a more powerful interest in protecting the employment of that person because if the state accepts the marriage of that person, the state has a, has a strong interest in protecting that person's livelihood, uh, ex protecting the dignity of the status conferred by marriage, and protecting that person's prospective or actual family. Uh, and so I would not argue in favor of a conscious exception. To so make the case harder, it's Georgia has no non-discrimination provision about same-sex parties. Uh, and make the party, the couple themselves, go to New York and get married there. Uh, Jack and George go to New York and get married, and they come back, and they're now married. He gets dismissed. How do you come out now? Statute's an easy foil. A civil marriage endorsement's an easy foil. Make it harder. There's a fundamental First Amendment right. There's a fundamental, um, refer uh, there's fundamental statutory rights uh, for religious employers. Um, and then there is a, what's the right of the party on the other side? I mean, unfortunately, in this case, I, I don't think that the uh, same-sex couple or the LGBT employee would have any recourse. I mean, we, we see this every day in most of uh, the states in our union. We don't have non-discrimination laws to protect people from termination of their employment based on sexual orientation. Uh, I think that if you're following the law, the court would have to come out against the people and um, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, if there is there a state, religious state RIFRA. under state RIFRA, um, which is a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which directs the courts to apply a heightened scrutiny to uh, claims based on religious liberty, um, the the couple would just lose, or the LGBT employee would simply lose. And in my opinion, that's a very unfortunate uh, situation. Um, this this business held itself out to the public and should be granting services to the public and employing members of the state or of the commonwealth um, without regard to their personal characteristics. But in such a case, I mean, the law is pretty clear. Let's do one more hypo. We've got seven minutes before I promised you you guys could speak. Um, and you've been very patient, and I'm very grateful my colleagues are as well. So let me do one more hypo uh, to open the conversation a bit wider, and then the marriage conversation will inevitably follow. Um, person religiously sincere, conscientiously opposed to same-sex marriage is an employee of the state working in the state registration office that's in the business of dispatching marriage licenses. Uh, there are 10 desks uh, that a person can go to that wants to come in to get a marriage license. Um, nine of the desks are occupied by people that are happy to give both uh, straight and gay marriage licenses as the individual state allows. Uh, but this particular party does not. This particular party is deeply conscientiously opposed, can hand out registration forms with the best of them, can type up a storm as a wonderful employee, but does not want to give out marriage certificates to gay couples, lesbian couples, that come before him. Um, he's fired. Because a gay couple came, he refused to give a license, all the other nine desks are available, but they insisted on going to him. And he says, I've been fired on discriminatory grounds. I have a fundamental religious freedom claim uh, to not participate in this institution called same-sex marriage, and I'm being forced to be an accomplice in what I consider to be a morally odious act, contrary to scripture. You have a claim? Under current constitutional jurisprudence, no. And you can make a fairly easy out by picking out a statute or Religious Freedom Restoration Act or something, but under the Constitution, as it's currently interpreted, no. If I could take a quick flight of fancy, I wonder, though, if maybe we should be rethinking how we conceive of equal protection. When the Equal Protection Clause was passed, the idea was that every state government would be bound to provide full protections to people based on their common law rights, based on their constitutional rights. At common law in England, you had the right to keep your job unless there was a you didn't have the right to keep your job. You had the right to access public accommodations unless there was a good reason for keeping you out. 
Under American custom, for at least 45, 50 years now, that kind of protection has extended to hiring. It's more or less understood that unless you have some sort of reason for not hiring somebody, unless you have a reason to fire them, you can't go prying into their personal life or into their lifestyle choices in order to make decisions about hiring. If you look at racial civil rights, if you look at the Americans with Disabilities Act, if you look at state anti-discrimination statutes, the idea is if you can reasonably accommodate somebody seeking employment, then you are bound to do so. I think that if we were able to undo a lot of 14th Amendment jurisprudence and maybe start fresh, it is perfectly possible that the gay worker for the mom and pop might actually have a constitutional claim that the state must protect him. It is equal protection of the law. If this is a common law right, then the state must protect it. Likewise, hypothetically, this public employee would be able to say, you have to make reasonable measures to accommodate me. I think if you have an office of 10 public employees, you have one who's unwilling to sign that license, I think that's the kind of de minimis thing that would absolutely be something that the state should accommodate in order to protect that worker. As a matter of policy, because I think it is a bit of a de minimis thing in this case, where it's a matter of getting your license signed by this clerk as opposed to that one on the one side and the clerk's job on the other one, I think that this is the kind of thing that a statute ought to accommodate if it doesn't currently, even under our current schema. Professor Perry. John, the, the legislation that Doug Laycock and, the, and, and I and Berg and Stern have recommended to the state legislatures would protect that person because it makes a distinction between the situation you carefully outline and the situation where it would be a major inconvenience to the person. Um, let, me, let me just say that um, for the constitutional students out in the audience, there is a very interesting argument going on as we speak about whether those who are committed to what is known as the originalist understanding of the Constitution uh, can't offer powerful originalist arguments for the court deciding in favor of same-sex marriage under the Equal Protection Clause. I thought that was worth, my students know that, I thought that was worth noting that conservative originalist scholars are now thinking along those lines. Um, I, I, I think these, these cases, or these hypothetical cases, um, they're not very, so hypothetical in Canada, again, as you know, um, do, do raise some important questions for us about uh, whether we're playing some kind of zero-sum game here, where um, we, we, we have to use the law to, um, to enforce a certain kind of moral perspective. Um, I, I do think that it is impossible for law to operate without some moral commitments. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, advocating some uh, full, as I would regard it, neutrality in the matter of law and morality. Um, but I think we have to be careful about zero-sum games. Uh, and I don't believe in Christian corner stores either. Um, you know, I, 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 a corner store does not have a religious purpose, however religious the purposes of the owners may be in the way they conduct themselves. And so I, I think the answer to the first one was easy. Um, but with the second hypo, I would like to do what you did with the first one and make it more difficult um, uh, in, in a certain sense. That is to make it, uh, to put it in sharper relief. Suppose you're a doctor in Tasmania and someone comes to you for an abortion and you say no. The law compels you to refer them to someone who will do the abortion. Now, you may have your views about whether uh, same-sex relations are moral or not. You may have your views about whether same-sex marriage is, is required by the Constitution or not. Um, uh, but, but what uh, is being asked for is quite different when you're talking about a living human being in the womb who is going to be killed. So, if you're a doctor and you're, and you're forced either to refer to one who will kill it or you're the only doctor there and so you're being required to kill it yourself, 
that's a quite different and more difficult scenario and it raises the question more sharply about whether we are in fact beginning to play zero-sum games here in the matter of law and morality. Final word for Mr. Wilson before we turn to you uh, for some august words from the floor. Mr. Wilson. Well, I, don't, I, I think in terms of, of marriage clerks in, in different counties throughout the United States, I don't think it's necessarily a, a zero-sum game. Like Matt said, I think that if you know there are 10 clerks standing at the desk and, and one has a problem with it, I think that's a sort of de minimis issue. However, you also have to look at it from the standpoint of um, there was a case in New York after uh, the marriage equality bill passed, and there was a clerk up in the Finger Lakes region, and um, her office wasn't necessarily huge, and there were days when she was there by herself or with one or two other people, and she, and I think she was the chief clerk for uh, her office, and she absolutely refused to give marriage licenses to same-sex couples. And I think that when you're an employee of the state and the state passes a law um, that you must enforce, she is in an, in an enforcement and facilitation position. And there is there is something to be said that even though it, it violates your religious freedom, perhaps by uh, having to issue the license, you're in a position that is, you're representing the state, and you cannot interpose your religious beliefs in, in, in sort of in the channel between state power and the citizen who's going to be a beneficiary of it. And I think that if states start allowing just pell-mell clerks to opt out of granting marriage licenses, I think there are establishment clause issues that come into place because there are very, if, if we're not gonna draw lines, there could be very conceivable that in some small areas there might be one county clerk on duty. And do we wanna say that a state that supports same-sex marriage cannot actually effectuate its mandate through clerks who refuse to perform them? And I think at a certain point, um, uh, I would say, and I think the Supreme Court might also agree with me even though Matt and some others would say that they, the jurisprudence needs to be changed on this, but there was one case where the Supreme Court said, look, your religious views cannot change the operations and uh, rules that the government has in place for effectuating its laws and its mandates. And uh, I believe that was a case on actually a Native American um, father who, who did not want his daughter to be registered with a social security number. He actually argued that that would destroy her spirit um, but the Supreme Court said, look, this is the way the government does things, and you cannot interpose your beliefs into it. So in the same way in marriage clerks giving out marriage licenses, I, I don't think here that you can bring your beliefs to bear on an official duty. Excellent. Um, we've got a lot of other venues we can uh, think about these issues, but we're starting to see the places where we're trying to do what Professor Perry calls reasonable accommodation and trying to avoid what Professor Farrow calls zero-sum games. And sometimes there are zero-sum games that have to be engaged, and the question is, is where are they in this debate? Uh, and are there other, way, other venues where we can think through this clash between LGBT equality and rights and religious freedom? Uh, those are the things that we'll want to begin to talk about with you. Uh, the floor is gonna be open to questions to any to the whole panel or to any individual panelist. Um, timidity is not a virtue that we know about in Emory Law students, and so I encourage you uh, to be bold and to state your uh, concerns uh, pithily and provocatively to the panel. There are microphones in the middle of the, of the uh, auditorium uh, where we can record uh, your sterling questions. Uh, we'd be grateful if you could use them, and if uh, you're in a position where you can't uh, get access to the microphone, we're happy to have one brought to you. Please. I can't you. see you, but I can, I can see that somebody's there. <laughs> Thank you guys all for coming out and ably arguing uh, your positions. Uh, I noticed from the beginning it was almost stipulated that there is a fundamental right to religious freedom, and um, we didn't really go down that path. Um, my question is to the entire panel, um, should we take it for granted that such a right is uh, inviolate and that it, um, well, not necessarily inviolate, but um, that it should always way out over the case of um, interfering with others? Well, the, the right to religious freedom is uh, a conditional right. It's not an absolute right. The right not to be tortured is absolute. So government can't say if we can satisfy the certain conditions we get to torture. Government may not torture full stop. Of course, you can argue about whether something is torture. But the right to religious freedom is conditional. 
government uh, doesn't have to accommodate or respect a religious practice if it satisfies certain conditions. But nonetheless, the bar is high and government has to satisfy those conditions. So I think that any hypotheticals you might suggest where there's a conflict between some interest the state is trying to serve, some interest it's trying to protect, and some religious practice would be adjudicated by asking the question whether government had satisfied the conditions, which if satisfied, permit it to proceed with its regulation. Please. I mean, yeah. nobody here endorsed an absolute right to religious freedom. P Professor Farrell and I agreed with the other two panelists that in the case of a mom and pop, no, just saying I'm religious, this is a problem for me, doesn't automatically become your get out of jail free card. but. It is fundamental in that it, it should be taken cognizance of. It's one of our founding freedoms. It's at the heart of the First Amendment. It was an important part of both English and American struggles for liberty. It's enshrined in international human rights documents throughout the world. The consistent jurisprudence of this country has been that if there are ways to accommodate differences among private citizens, and Tim, you're right, when a private citizen enters a public role, things can get trickier. And indeed, you do lose some measure of your individual rights when you become a public officer. But on the whole, yes, this is absolutely a part of our legal equation. I think it belongs there. And I think it's right that this is one of the frames that we're discussing these issues in. Religious people carry their senses of convictions of what the Laycock brief called these highest obligations even when they step outside of the church and say into their job or into even a government position. I would just very briefly say that um, most of religious liberty is, is not an unconditional right, but there are certain aspects, the right to freedom of conscience or rather just the liberty of your conscience, I would argue is an absolute right, the ability to hold opinions about your duties to whatever divinity or, or transcendent reality that you adhere to is one that is inherent and unconditional. And for example, the state could not coerce you into holding or practicing some other kind of religious faith or could not coerce um, someone to act as a county clerk and give a civil marriage license to someone. So there, there, there are certain absolute barriers that do protect your core freedom of conscience, but we've always held in the United States that once you start practicing, once you start smoking religious peyote or uh, deciding not to give your infant uh, blood transfusions, then the law has a place to step in and there are other rights and interests that trump your, uh, your objective and your idea of what is the greatest truth. I think I want to add only that, uh, that an absolute right uh, such as not to be tortured um, itself is an expression of uh, a view of the universe and a view of human beings that is um, morally fraught and which has grown out of religious ideas and contexts. Um, and whilst I'm happy to, to uh, agree that um, that there are uh, rights that must never be violated and rights that must be weighed up against other rights. Um, uh, I do also acknowledge that uh, someone with a quite different worldview, a uh, Nietzsche say, uh, might, uh, might not agree with me that torture is, is an absolute and, and the state in which I live serving the society of which we are a part would have to make some kind of zero-sum decision about uh, something at that level, yes. Please. Hey there. Uh, so I had a question, um, I guess, to the whole panel. Uh, I know it was mentioned earlier, the parent's right to impart uh, its belief, his, her belief, whatever, on the child or children. Um, in a particular instance where a parent finds being homosexual, uh, transgender, LGBT in general, if they find that morally reprehensible that their child could possibly be LGBT, could that parent take that child and say, hey, you have to go to a clinic and change your sexuality or fix yourself? Uh, and th this, I guess, could include gays, 
uh, bisexuals, transgender folks, whatever? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't understand uh, the idea of parents finding that their child's sexual orientation itself is morally reprehensible. That makes no sense, since whether something's morally reprehensible depends on what one is doing or choices one makes. They might think that it's psychologically defective, unnatural, requiring therapy, but, um, but if we're talking simply about status, someone says, my sexual orientation, maybe even lamentably, says lamentably, my sexual orientation is same sex, it's very hard for me to think of people whose heads are screwed on right, who aren't confused, saying that is morally reprehensible. Psychologically problematic, defective, in need of therapy, unnatural, those are different categories. Granting that there are people who think that way, though, and I am not among them, but granting that they exist, I think that is one of those places where you start weighing up different rights. So I can envision a spectrum here starting with make the child go to a church where the pastor will say that this is inherently disordered at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum being the kind of full-blown borderline physical torture that we saw emerge in the past couple of years and that I think California had on its mind when it attempted to ban corrective therapy a few years ago. I think that this is a question of weighing rights. Children have the right to be free from physical torture, from emotional abuse, from verbal abuse. As far as what, where that line is in between you know, tying somebody up with electrical shock devices and simply offering verbal ethical condemnations of activity, there, there's going to be some gray areas there. And I think that's more of an empirical question of just trying to figure out how much harm is too much. Well, not empirical, but empirical and moral. Empirical in the sense of it would have to be done more case by case, I think. I, I think what, what Matt uncovers here in talking about where to draw the line on an issue like this is the fact that uh, culturally and legally we give parents such a wide latitude in, in uh, organizing familial relations and deciding how their children will be raised, what ideologies, what faith, um, what manner they will grow up. And oftentimes, you know, the constitutional rights of children are very minimal, especially when compared to that of their parents. Uh, like he said, you know, you can, of course, torture a child or coerce a child um, to, do, to do certain things. But uh, in the case of reparative therapy, which is a very controversial and disturbing subject for many of us. Um, I, would, I would submit that we need to have a new paradigm uh, in, in family relations and one in which children are more protected from these, from these kinds of things, not just physical abuse, but emotional and verbal abuse. And I think that reparative therapy may be part and parcel of that. And we do have to be careful in the way we draw lines because we can't prevent parents from um, inculcating values and religious opinions in their children. That is something that is pretty much inviolate. But we do have to be careful about the different emotional and psychological consequences that some of these decisions and going down this road of, I disapprove of you, I disapprove of what actions you might take, therefore you need therapy, therefore you need these certain kinds of therapy. And when in this day and age, a lot of states are now starting to reconsider even licensing these kinds of therapists, I think we need to be careful. And right now in the marriage debate and in the marriage cases that happened last week, you know, we saw a lot of people on the um, opposition to same-sex marriage say, think of the children. And we need to, and Justice Scalia said, the jury's out, you know, on the effects of uh, same-sex marriage and same-sex parenting on children. But really in our legal discourse, this is one of the first times we've been hearing a, a sort of general interest in the rights of children. And so I think we need to have a more holistic view of the rights of children, one that takes into account their interests and their psychological well-being as well as that of their parents and the parents' right to inculcate values into them. I think this, this uh, issue, uh, again, drives us deeply into the problem that, that uh, we are facing. Um, who is going to decide the, who is going to decide what is in the best interest of the child? 
I've been watching the literature a little bit on the development of children's rights, and it seems to me that a lot of it is being uh, is moving in the direction of pitting children's rights against parental rights, and so uh, turning to the state and yes to the judiciary uh, as the mediator and arbiter of these things. Now, these things inevitably involve both moral and religious uh, understandings and worldviews. And so it, it seems to me that the drift, uh, although we're early in the process, uh, is towards asking the state and, uh, and the judiciary to be the arbiters of what are ultimately uh, deep-rooted questions about what the human being is and what it's for. Uh, so I, I think this, this ought to concern us a great deal and, uh, and needs very, very close attention. And I think we have to be very careful about the demise of the family as a sphere into which the, the state uh, should intrude um, only as, as a last resort and in very serious uh, situations. But frankly, uh, with the divorce culture that we have created in North America, um, we have been uh, um, laying the groundwork for that kind of, of turning to the state as arbiter to defend the child against abuse by the parents. It's now second nature to us. And, and, and so I fear that we're not looking at it nearly as critically as we should be. Thank you. Thank you all for a very interesting panel. My question concerns the T in LGBT issues, which we haven't discussed to a very large extent today. Uh, and I feel like often it's bundled up together uh, as one issue, whereas in fact it's um, rather different legal issues that come to play. Um, and the issue I'm, the, the reason I'm asking is that um, in two cases, the European Court of Human Rights, the first was B versus France in 92, and the second was Goodwin versus UK in 2002, the issue of transgender identity and the right to correct one's gender um, actually provoked higher scrutiny than the right to sexual identification on the basis that it's a gender equality issue, not necessarily a sexual uh, identity equality issue. So I would like your take on that, and also if we need a higher awareness of transgender issues in the legal debate. Thank you. I've been trying to defend the, the Q at least a little bit, um, so thanks for adding the T. Um, and, and of course, as I pointed out earlier, we could keep going. Uh, uh, I, I worry about, um, as I said earlier, about uh, generating uh, significant changes to the law and to public policy until we've got some of these issues uh, sorted out a little more clearly. I would just say personally that in, in terms of uh, my consciousness of the legal debate, uh, same-sex marriage is dominating it, and that's not something that really speaks to the most pressing needs of transgendered individuals. And there's a lot of criticism of LGBT, or in this case, LGB advocacy of uh, civil marriage for same-sex couples because it, it leaves out the T and the needs of transgendered individuals. Uh, in responding to your comment about the European jurisprudence on it, I, I think it's very interesting, and I think it would be a great a great template for U.S. courts to look at discrimination against transgendered individuals because, I mean, this is an issue of gender and the definition of gender, and it's my personal opinion that transgendered individuals who experience discrimination and roadblocks to their um, their definition of self is is a gender discrimination issue and should receive heightened scrutiny. But that's a that's a long fight here in the United States, and that's not one that we're going to be seeing uniformity on in any. Point in the immediate future. We also want to speak to this, or we go to the next person in the queue. Sir, I think, sir. Um, today, uh, there's been discussion of religious freedom, but I think it's mainly been done in the context of Christianity, or perhaps even more specifically, Catholicism. We don't really talk about, about say, an imam in a madrasa, or rabbi at yeshiva, or Buddhist rug sellers, or Hindu clerks. Is it possible to frame this as really an argument of Christianity on the issue of same-sex marriage, and what might that implicate for things like majority rule and the separation of religion and uh, national identity? 
I mean, as far as I'm aware, Orthodox Jews, a number I'm of... I'm sorry, let me add, and I do understand that uh, all of those religious denominations may have people who go in either direction on that issue. Sorry. Right, and uh, I think that's precisely the point here, is that this does impact a large number of Orthodox Jews, of Muslims of various varieties, of other folks as well. So I, I understand that the most prominent voices in this have been Christians, especially a certain bent, but I, I don't think that that necessarily has much bearing as far as how we think of it. Even if it is just one community, which it's not, even if it were, I mean, our rights exist to protect small minorities as well as large majorities, and the law has a place for all of them, so. I, I think personally that, that uh People move too quickly on the same-sex marriage issue to, uh, to moral and religious questions. I, I do think that moral and religious questions are involved on any fundamental human question, and, and marriage and sexuality are, are, are fundamental human questions. But I think we move too quickly to it. Uh, my own, my own uh, uh, public criticisms of same-sex marriage have have been based on on two features of it, which I think uh, should be problematic to anyone, whether whether they are religious or not uh, particularly religious, and whatever religion they hold to. Um, the the first is that uh, it, it's not actually a, a, an anti-discrimination uh, argument. Uh, Same-sex marriage as a concept has to create a discrimination in order to repudiate a discrimination. That's the logical flaw in it that I was referring to earlier. If marriage is between a man and a woman, and if everyone is either a man or a woman, whatever is happening with their sexuality and their orientation and so forth, and if every man and woman has a right to marry, then nobody is excluded from marriage. So there's no possibility of discrimination except the kind of self-discrimination that we use when we decide whether to marry or not. If you want to change the definition, as you're now arguing about doing here and as we've already done in Canada, then of course you create a situation where discrimination is possible. If marriage is simply the union of two persons, and you exclude two persons who happen to be of the same sex, that's discriminatory and you have to refuse uh, to permit that kind of discrimination. But the original definition doesn't include that kind of discrimination, is not discriminatory, and therefore the definition should not be changed on the basis of the fact that it is discriminatory when the discrimination potential only enters in once the new definition is in place. So that's, that's not a religious argument, that's simply a logical analysis of the situation. The second, the second objection is that, is that marriage uh, understood as same-sex marriage does not expand our political freedoms but contracts them because it makes marriage itself something that is a creature of the state, subject to whatever definition the people want to give it or that the state wants to give it. And that means that it's no longer pre-political. It's not a natural uh, pre-political area into which the state should not intrude as per Article 16 of the Universal Declaration. So it changes the relationship between the citizen and the state for everybody, not just for a few people. And that ought to worry us. It contracts rather than expands our, our civil liberties. Those are not religious arguments. Um, there are moral and religious arguments to have about the subject, and I think we should have them, but I think we move too quickly to them. I'm going to ask for uh, patience on the part of my colleagues so that we can get more of you into the conversation. To the gentleman's question that was just put, there's no question that while religious freedom is universally available to all, uh, religious freedom conversations in the United States have been unusually shaped by Judeo-Christian values, and indeed Christian values. And it's a telling anecdote to say that no Jew no Muslim, no Hindu, and no Native American Indian has ever won a religious freedom claim before the U.S. Supreme Court. Sir, I'm so sorry, madam. Uh, thank you very much. My question goes off of, off of his actually a little bit. A little bit. Um, regarding the argument that same-sex marriage infringes upon religious freedom, how do you reconcile that argument with the religions that do permit and support same-sex marriage? Uh, isn't the federal definition of marriage between a man and a woman, doesn't that infringe upon their rights to religious freedom? <laughs> 
No, not in and of itself, in that the government's not saying you can't identify as married, your religious institution doesn't recognize you or, or can't recognize you as married. Were the government to do that, then yes, I think it would be a violation of religious freedom. Were the government to come in and tell the Quakers you cannot recognize these relationships, that would be a problem. But that still doesn't really answer the question of what the government does with its own graces. For example, there are religious people in this country today for whom polygamy is a prescription. And I think, frankly, that when the government makes arrests of, well, a lot of the cases involving polygamy lately have involved child marriage and other issues, and that's fair. But where you have consensual adult polygamy and the government arrests people for practicing it, I think there is a case there that when it's done for religious re reasons, that violates their religious freedom. I don't think that the government is violating their religious freedom by not recognizing their relationships, though. I think there's a distinction there. So I don't think religious freedom is the linchpin that decides this either way. I think that there are debates to be had on questions of equal protection and whatnot, but I don't think that you can expand from a negative freedom of religion to the government must recognize what your religion recognizes for its own purposes. Yeah, the, the fact that some government policies are more congenial to certain religious views than others, which would be the case, um, doesn't necessarily mean that the right to religious freedom has been violated. It depends on the rationale for those policies. You could imagine if the only rationale for the policy was a theological rationale, then you might have a serious claim that the policy was violating someone's religious freedom. But that's a big if. I would uh, uh, love to hear you the panel's thoughts on a question that I had to uh, struggle with Professor Whittison this year in working on a, a comment of mine. Um, it seems that there is a, uh, a spectrum where at, at some point across the line a religious organization is no longer permitted to discriminate. And we have churches, private schools, licensed religious officials, groups that receive uh, federal funds, and then businesses. Where, how do we draw that line? What's the theoretical justification for at some point permitting discrimination <clears throat> by private religious schools, but then once, for instance, the Christian Legal Society is organized on a law school's campus, it is no longer permitted to discriminate. How do we better articulate that line? I would, I would offer the view that um, the, that's a great test case is the Christian Legal Society versus Martinez case, um, where just as a really quick background in California, um, the Christian Legal Society uh, was chartered at um, a state college, and the college, of course, receives federal funds, and the college had a non-discrimination policy, uh, and the Christian Legal Society had a different policy saying that we do not uh, take people in that have certain moral behaviors that violate scripture. So they... Uh, excluded them and then they were dechartered and sort of expelled from the school student organization uh, apparatus. I would argue that once you start getting government funds or government recognition in some way, then you are subject to some level of scrutiny. I, uh, I would just point out that churches or receive nonprofit status or schools receive incorporated status and are subject to some sort of regulation and incorporation. But yet that's not the obviously what decides. Certainly, but when a church or um, is acting, for example, as a, uh, uh, through a faith-based initiative uh, on the federal level, they have to be very strict for how they account for those funds. Um, so they have to account for where it's going, uh, who's, pay, uh, who's being paid, or is it being used for proselytism, or is it being used for vaccinations? And I, I think Christian Legal Society presents a more difficult question because this is a university receiving bulk funds and then saying, because you know, we received these funds from the federal government, you're not going to discriminate. Um, it, it presents, I think, important uh, association issues. And I think Matt would like to speak to that a little more. I think that's true, but I don't think that Christian Legal Society is the test case for when a religious organization stops being religious enough. I think it's fairly clear that Christian Legal Society is a religious organization. 
I think the harder cases are when we get into the contraception mandate cases where you have a group like Hobby Lobby saying, yes, we manufacture craft supplies. We have a corporate Christian culture that we want to identify with. So if we had a religious ministry that was operating for-profit businesses, I think that's actually where you get into the harder questions of expressive association. And the closest case that we've had to deal with that involved the Boy Scouts a few years ago, Dale v. Boy Scouts of America, where a gay scout master sued the Boy Scouts after he was dismissed from the organization. The organization includes as one of its tenants that homosexual activity is not appropriate, and they dismissed him. The Supreme Court said that although the Boy Scouts is not a religious organization, although it does not primarily exist to put forward an ethical stance in the world, its ethical stance is one of the reasons, its ethical stances as a whole are one of the reasons that it chooses to come together and to associate, and that the First Amendment allows people to do that and to exclude people who contradict that group's ideas that comes down from another case a few years before that, Turley, where a gay group petitions to be able to march in the St. Patrick's Day parade in Boston under the banner of the parade. The parade said that they didn't want to have that message associated with themselves. And the Supreme Court said that, again, this is not a religious parade. It's not even a political parade, but it's a parade that has a clear stance on an issue and to saying that they don't want to have to give voice or cover to a group that they disagreed with. I don't think that the courts have a clear idea of when religion is religious enough. By the time we get to the mom and pop store, apparently all of us agree that that's not good enough. Does that mean that you just can't fire somebody? Does that mean that you have to affirmatively recognize a partner or provide contraceptive coverage? I'm not sure that the court has a clear stand on that yet, and I think we're gonna see it in the contraception cases over the next year or so. We have about uh, eight minutes left, and we have uh, four patient souls who've been waiting. And let me, so that we can credit your respective questions, give each of you, Siriatum, the floor. Let each of you put your questions, and our panelists will then grab the question they can answer, I ignore the ones that are too hard. <laughs> uh, and that will give us a chance to hear from you, uh, more importantly than hearing more from us. Uh, please, sir. Okay, I just want to take a, a step back for a second from the legal analysis. I realize that this is a legal panel. We're in the law school. I'm a lawyer. I get it. Um, these are important exercises to go through. But uh, especially when legal arguments are made against same-sex marriage while at the same time uh, confessing, and I appreciate the honesty, Professor Farrell, uh, that we don't really all ne necessarily know what LGBT is and means. Um, I think it's really important at the end of the day to think about what the legal conclusions ultimately will do to people. When you grow up um, LGBT, and I, I think unless you are LGBT or identify with some other sort of minority group uh, or a group that's been persecuted throughout history in some form or fashion, um, I don't think you can completely comprehend what happens when society around you and the laws and the government under which you live conclude that for something that you, and I will argue, are born with, it's like some sort of condition, uh, that that warrants being treated differently in some way. And in this particular case, in the context of same-sex marriage, in our view, treated in a way where you are not granted the same rights. You are not granted the same equality to live out the way you were, you know, the condition that you were born with. Um, I just think it's very, very important to understand that because when I was in high school and I started to see, I mean, I think I realized my same-sex attraction, maybe as young as like seven or eight, but definitely no later than middle school. I kept it a secret all the way up until my senior year of high school, and I started to go to a therapist in the high school, and I said, I might be gay. And she was really pretty cool and said, well, so what? What's the big deal? And I'm like, are you crazy? What do you mean, what's the big deal? Like, do you see how, how your status in society is different? Like, I'm not gonna be able to get married and have kids. I'm not, you know, it's, it's a whole slew of things. Um, 
You know, and I had things pretty good because my family um, is, it's like the Rocky Horror Picture fan club. I have very liberal parents. And, A question, um, please. And despite that, it was extremely traumatic to still nevertheless deal with this issue with the way society um, kind of deems you to be. Um, and I just think it's important to know that. Does that mean that you should necessarily go back and change your legal analysis and legal conclusions? Not necessarily, but I think that you better be damn sure that you're right. Because at the end of the day, we have kids committing suicide. I had an overdose in, in college, like over 10 years ago, over this issue. Um, I mean, you talk about abortion, this, there are life and death issues here as well. Um, so just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Appreciate all of you being on the panel. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, gentleman beside you. I had a question specifically for Professor Farrow. <clears throat> um, I thought it was interesting that you said the LGBT community is not cohesive enough to be able to be addressed in um, legal discourse. My question, um, as we seek you know, for the recognition of our rights to express our sexualities and our genders, my question for you was, how do you think the religious um, class people can be defined? To me, it seems like there are more religions and there are sexualities that seek to be expressed. Having grown up a Mormon, I know that even in, within the Mormon church, there are multiple versions of it, but that's within Christianity. Christians don't think that Mormons are Christian. So I just wanted to know what is coherent about the religious class that the LGBT community lacks. Please. Um, thank you very much to uh, everybody on the panel. It was a really great um, experience. Uh, Mr. Uh, Franklin articulated my question and my points really well. I, uh, just a sort of a general policy point. What happens when the law fails um, to acknowledge human experience, human flourishing, what we know to be human experience and human flourishing, and it's particularly for children, and I think that was touched upon on the panel a little bit, capturing the voices of children. So, uh, Professor Witte, your hypothetical at the private Catholic school, what is it like that Jack and George, and even though we, you know, we work through the legal analysis of that, if they can't go to the prom together, what kind of an environment in the education system are we fostering for children? And as Mr. Franklin so eloquently articulated, that can be really damaging, and homophobia can be very damaging, and there's a lot of pain and suffering and anguish there. And what can we do in this generation currently where these issues are at the forefront and um, in order to change that, because we really can change that and how can we resolve this tension between well this is a catholic school and i find homosexuality more re morally reprehensible and so we're not going to allow jack and george to go how can we i don't know if those can be reconciled but i think that the the voices of children in this whole conversation um, is really important so thank you thank you final question for my uh, so i kind of want to take this to the more granular level and say uh, look at maryland's recent uh civil marriage protection act um, and it seems to be the consensus on the panel that for-profit entities aren't inherently religiously motivated and thus not deserving of special um, exemptions and protections. Um, you know, the Maryland law, I think, did a very good job of very broadly protecting religious institutions and religious nonprofits, um, including preserving tax-exempt status, um, uh, adoption services provided that don't accept federal funds. I mean, there's a whole slew of protections that Maryland chose to robustly protect religious freedom. So my question to you is if we're providing these very broad, robust protections for religious institutions and religiously affiliated nonprofits from a facilitating marriages that they cannot in good conscience agree with, what more can we do as same-sex marriage advocates to protect religious liberty if, in fact, for-profit entities aren't deserving of those exemptions? Excellent. Those are uh, four or five excellent um, sets of issues that uh, you put on the table. We have a suite of things available. I'm going to use uh, the prerogative of the chair to simply assign uh, from my right to my left uh, an opportunity for about a minute uh, reflection by each of my colleagues on the panel uh, before we uh, conclude. I'll start with uh, my colleague. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what to say in response to that wonderful array of, of questions. Um, let me just say, since this is my last time to speak, that I, I think um, I'm an academic, you know, and I have this unfortunate tendency to judge the success of a gathering in terms of how intellectually productive it's been. But I think that's a mistake. We're, the subject matter is too, for this afternoon, the subject matter is too large and unruly. And I think the uh, success of this endeavor should be measured by the fact that we gathered here this afternoon uh, 
to address a very important, uh, complicated set of issues. And uh, we'll all have the opportunity to the extent these issues engage us to think more systematically about them, more carefully about them uh, in hopefully very non-polemical context, the context of classrooms and, uh, and elsewhere. So let me just say farewell with that comment. Well, thank you to Tim and Professor Witte and both of our other panelists for coming out today and to you all for being here. Really appreciate it. I'll just hone in on one of those questions, and that was the one about for-profits. I don't think that profit is the magic word that removes all religious liberty protections. I think hiring, because of the way that we think about it in this country, is something that is more immune as long as there is no other infringement of religious liberty. But can I imagine certain circumstances under which even hiring could come under scrutiny? Sure, the easiest one is the ministerial exception, forcing a church to hire a clergyman who disagrees with their message. And there are others as well. I can imagine that I think a lot of the contraception mandate claims are colorable, including some by for-profit Bible publishing companies and probably by private corporations as well who outside the context of hiring say, we as a corporation can't affirm certain things that go against our culture and our beliefs. So just, I would guess I would just say that that question is still open and I don't think that profit is the magic threshold for the end of rights. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out for this conversation. It is somewhat unruly and somewhat uh, unexplored and it's important that we keep in mind that we continue this dialogue and that it be civil um, and that we not emulate the media and those who um, just like to go back and forth and score points and, and try to see points of commonality between those of uh, sincere religious conviction uh, who might not entirely support um, equality for LGBT individuals because it's better to try to bridge gaps rather than widen them. Um, I would like to just respond to the personal color of some of the questions. People are clearly, have very strongly held beliefs that sexual identity is not something that necessarily can be changed. It's not something that's mutable, as the courts would say. And uh, Professor Farrow mentioned that, uh, you know, marriage is something that, that is a pre-political institution and therefore is, is outside of state control. But, and, and on that argument, uh, LGBT activists are asking for redress for a discrimination that they actually brought about in the first place because we're asking for something that does not exist. I would submit that uh, for decades now, marriage has been changed at the governmental level, both at states and at the federal level, um, to bring gender parity, for example, in marriage. Uh, there's no fault divorce now, and many people would actually bemoan uh, those developments and saying that it, you know marriage is unraveling some of them are sitting here today um, but marriage as it stands today is is for better or for worse a contract and one that comes with many benefits by both federal and state governments and excluding loving couples from that contract on the basis of their sexual orientation is something that does implicate profound issues of equality, equal protection, and due process. And I just do think that as it stands today, opposite sex marriage is a discriminatory institution because of what it is. It's contractual and benefits come with it. Benefits that mean a lot for the spouses and for the children that they may have now or in the future. Well, final word to Professor Farrell. I, I, Thank you for giving me the final word. I thank you for, uh, as one outlaw to another, inviting me to this uh, gathering. And uh, uh, I will remark, uh, uh, following on from what Tim just said, that um, if, if marriage, uh, it, it makes no difference to me, although it's a big argument down here, whether, whether same-sex marriage should come from the, the people democratically or from, or from the judiciary. Uh, um, if we are going to understand marriage as essentially a contract, a contractual relation in which a close personal relationship is turned into a formal contract and recognized by the state as such, uh, then I agree, as I've said before, it would be discriminatory. 
to uh, exclude uh, from this uh, couple uh, couples or, uh, in my view, uh, trios, whatever, uh, of, of the same sex or some combination of sexes and genders. Um, but that is not uh, how marriage has been understood. And I think it's very important to be clear, even in your own arguments, that marriage as it was understood is not discriminatory. My only task left is to invite you to join me in a robust round of applause for these four eloquent panelists. <laughs> and since you're clapping, I hope that you will reserve an extra round of applause for the organizer of this forum, uh, Mr. Timothy Wilson, uh, the head of Outlaw. These are conversations I hope that will continue, and I hope that we can continue in, informally and formally, uh, but the opportunity to be in deep conversation with uh, four deep uh, scholars who have thought about these things I think has been uh, deeply enriching. Uh, the next panel we hope will include uh, not just white males, uh, that'll include people of other genders, people of other races, other backgrounds. And, it's not to say that we're disqualified, but this is one set of perspectives, and we need to hear from uh, other groups with equal learning uh, that would come to this uh, stage uh, and share their perspectives with us. So thanks again for coming. I hope you have a good afternoon.